glad to be before you once again on this Lord's Day. Glad to have each of you here back with us this afternoon. If you would, let's all be turning to Acts chapter 26. I would like to consider a few thoughts from this chapter this afternoon. Here we find the Apostle Paul coming before Agrippa. And in verse 1 of Acts chapter 26, it says, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently. So Paul has been given the authority by the king to defend himself, to give a defense of why he's there. And he notes that King Agrippa is an expert in matters regarding the Jews. Well, in verse 4 and 5, Paul makes reference to his upbringing. He points out that he was a Pharisee, a very strict sect of the Jewish religion, if you will, and that's how he viewed life, and he was going to be faithful to the end. In verse 6, Paul says, And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, under which promise our twelve tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come, for which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. So he states why he's there. He's been accused for standing up, for proclaiming this promise that was made to their fathers. No doubt King Agrippa knows a little bit about this from a scripture standpoint, that is the Old Testament, will be readily available to them that day. Well, Paul continues in verse 8 all the way down, and he cites different things that he dealt with, specifically as Saul of Tarsus and a persecutor of the church, how he delivered Christians to be persecuted, facilitated their execution, and was, from a conscience standpoint, perfectly fine with all those things. And then he gets down to verse 14, or really at verse 13, and he opens up and he discusses his conversion of how Jesus speaks directly to him. And they have a conversation, he and the Lord. And thus, Saul of Tarsus is converted. Now, he's not saved, but he's going through this conversion process. But in verse 19, he picks up and says, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Because ultimately, Paul was discharged to be the apostle to the Gentiles. So Paul is making the claim to Agrippa that he is fulfilling his obligation in preaching to the Gentile world. And it is because of this preaching that he is now imprisoned and thus before King Agrippa. In verse 20, it says, But showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. That's a mouthful right there. So part of this preaching to the Gentiles included repent and turn to God. And then 
works of repentance. We should be able to see one's faith. We should be able to see the fact that one has repented of any sin that they've committed. It's not simply, I'm going to stop doing wrong. That's just half the battle. You've got to start doing right in addition to that. Otherwise, it's not true, full repentance. Mark shows of a man, of a man that, possessed by demons, kicks the demons out. But then the, those demons return and finding this mind cleaned, garnished, unoccupied. So this demon returns with several of his friends and occupies this house once again. But this time it's worse than the beginning. So we don't occupy our minds and, and lifestyles with good things, as the Bible would show what is good. So much easier to regress back and do those sinful things that we did prior. Working or doing works meet for repentance. But he continues. He points out, again, more different or different aspects of the preaching that he was engaged in. Verse 23 says that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Thus Christ has come. He has brought his light. He has given this light to men. And now we're able to obey the gospel just as the Jews were. In verse 24, it's an interesting discourse. It says, And he thus spake for himself. Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. So he's being criticized for his preaching. Do we expect any different treatment today? By and large, the world looks at the gospel as a foolish thing. Preaching of the gospel as a foolish thing. Their hearts are hardened to the gospel and the things of God, yet that doesn't change our obligation to the world is still be instant, in season, out of season, preaching the word, which is exactly what Paul is attempting to do. Well, he defends himself. I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. The words of truth and soberness. Poor old Oprah right now will be having a heart attack because there is not just one truth. It's your truth, my truth, and everybody else's truth. So that's just not the truth. There is but one truth. Verse 26 for the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. But see, now he's bringing in Agrippa and his conscience. He knows his background. Again, we point out that he was an expert in the, uh, the customs of the Jews. Thus, he would have access to the Old Testament scriptures and passages, writings of the prophets. He's familiar with these things. He continues, For I am persuaded that none of these things are, fred, are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. Verse 27, King Agrippa, Believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. So he's convicted the king. He's using his knowledge. That is, Paul is using King Agrippa's knowledge to point out that there's still yet things to do. And verse 28, which is really where I'm going with all this, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. I was told pretty regularly in school, and this was among my friends, I guess, the horseshoes and hand grenades were the only thing that almost was good in and sometimes depending on when you pull the pin it's not good in those things either but folks like to dwell in the almost area of life well I almost failed my test well why because you didn't study well enough well I almost 
did whatever. Typically, it shows that they weren't properly prepared for the thing that they're attempting to complete. But Paul has convinced Agrippa, using his own conscience, using his own knowledge, but Agrippa's not quite there yet. You look at the plan of salvation, and each of those first four steps, as we commonly refer to them as, it brings one unto salvation. So Agrippa is almost at salvation. He's been brought unto that point. Yet he's unwilling to go any further. He is unwilling to actually become a Christian. And verse 29 says, And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day, which in, that would include Festus, who just called Paul insane. Much learning doth make thee mad. So everyone that's present here hearing my discourse, we're both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. His earnest prayer was that everyone that had heard his preaching would not just almost be a Christian, but to indeed become a Christian, to obey the gospel. Yet in the following verses, verse 30, 31, and 32, they kind of push this matter aside and they discuss amongst themselves, well, he's not worthy of death, but he would have been better off if he had not appealed to Caesar. So they kind of sweep all this under the rug, if you will. Almost persuaded. We sing a song sometimes. And this is where that idea comes from. Paul was able, because he was a prisoner, to preach to King Agrippa and even Festus and many others that were present. Yet he was only almost persuaded. The world is full of folks that are almost persuaded to become a Christian. Because many of them think they're okay, that they've done enough. And really, some, based on their doctrine, would say that Agrippa was already saved. Because what do we read in verse 27? Believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Well, belief only salvation, right? No. Agrippa even understood that he wasn't a Christian. Many today, even though they might mentally ascend to the fact that God exists, that Jesus is his son, and the Bible is the very word of God, that's not enough. They're still not saved. They are not Christians. Yet they believe that they are. That's simply not enough. So we ask today, this afternoon, are you almost persuaded? Why not be altogether persuaded? Not just almost. Become a Christian if you're not one already. The next few moments has been dedicated for those who are not Christians yet would like to obey the gospel, render obedience to it, and in fact become a Christian. Or for those Christians who have not been living up to that name and need to make public confession, to be restored in the sight of their Creator. So each, whatever of these needs applies to you, please make it known as together now we stand and sing.